All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the ninth annual MSU Science Festival, an annual celebration of the STEAM disciplines. I'm so excited and glad to have you here today. Um, my name is Katherine Hagman. I'll be today's host. Um, and with me today, so excited to have you. Um, we have uh, Angelica Kabatu joining us from the MSU Department of Fisheries and Wildlife. Hi, Angelica. All right, um, and just so everyone know, knows who's joining us, feel free to answer any questions you have throughout the talk. If you're joining us on Zoom, um, there's a Q&A feature on the bottom of the screen you can use. And if you're joining us on Facebook, feel free to throw your questions in the chat and I will um, make sure that we have your questions answered at the end of the talk. Um, all right, so with that, um, Angelica, if you're ready, we can go ahead and get started. All right, sounds good, thank you. All right, so hi everyone and good evening. Um, my name is Angelica, like Catherine has said, and my mentors for this project are Dr. Brian Roth and Jake Sawecki. And today I'm going to be talking to you all about this mystery that we have in our Great Lakes, which is how do round goby, which is an invasive species, contribute to the food web? So overall, why should we care about the Great Lakes? Well, over 20% of the world's freshwater is contained in our lakes, which is pretty amazing. And we have also seen many ecosystem changes that have occurred in our Great Lakes, such as pollution. And a prime example of that is the Cuyahoga River fire, which has happened in 1969, along with overfishing, which pressured our lake trout populations in the lakes. Furthermore, we have seen the introduction of invasive species. And an invasive species is an organism that causes ecological or environmental harm in a new environment in which it is not native. So due to this introduction of invasive species, our Great Lakes has experienced a long history of biological change. So prior to the 1800s, the native predator that dominated our lakes was the lake trout, but the pressure of overfishing sort of pressured their population. Subsequently, the introduction of the sea lamprey further pressured their population because sea lamprey do prey on lake trout. Later on, we see this introduction of alewife and by 1960, they have become widespread and they have become so abundant to the point where in 1960 through 1970, we see sort of these large proportions of alewife die-offs, meaning a lot of these fish just die off and wash up to the shores of our beaches and fish are kind of stinky. So this ruined the aesthetic of the beach and called for action. And due to this, management thought that introducing Pacific salmon would be a great solution because one, Pacific salmon consume a lot of alewife. In fact, that is a big proportion of their diet, along with the fact that introducing salmon would introduce a multi-billion dollar industry to our lakes. In the 1800s, we begin to see a rise in invasive species that come from the Ponto-Caspian region, so the Black Sea or um, the Caspian Sea, which was introduced through ballast water, and we see these spiny water flea along with zebra mussels. Later on, we see the introduction of the round goby and quagga mussels. And by 1991, we see that the round goby population has become established inside of our lakes. So currently in the Great Lakes, we have this presence of dry sided mussels. And as a reminder, um, dry sanded mussels are zebra mussels and quagga mussels, which are known to sort of deplete the nutrients in the water column. And we also have an increase of native predators due to um, management. And with the introduction of salmon, we now have this multi-billion dollar industry in the Great Lakes that is dependent on alewife. And together, this strains limited prey resources. So in the figure to the right on the y-axis, we have alewife abundance. And on the x-axis, we have the years from 1975 through 2010. And we sort of see this undulation of um, alewife abundance. But in the early 2000s, we see that the alewife population has crashed. And this is particularly in Lake Huron, 
And we believe that this could possibly happen in Lake Michigan and endanger this multi-billion dollar industry that we have with salmon. So how do predators support themselves in Lake Michigan and Lake Huron? So we know that owl wife are an important prey item. So in the figure to the right on the Y axis, we have the percentage of owl wives. And then on the X axis, we have the months from May to September. And from this figure, we see that Chinook salmon along with lake trout have a large proportion of their diets depending on owl wives. However, the contribution of various prey items still remains unclear in particularly the round goby, which is my species of interest. And my question is, so how do round goby fit inside of the Great Lakes food web? And in our diet study, we have found that round goby consumption varies by species and by lake. So in the figure to the right on the y-axis, we have the proportion of diets measured in wet weight. And on the x-axis, we have the predator species. So round goby is, um, can be recognized by the dark blue bars. And we see that for brown trout and for walleye, brown gobies make a large proportion of their diets in Lake Huron. And the key to understanding the importance of round goby to the predator community is looking at the size structure of consumed fish. And what can size distribution tell us? Well, it could indicate foraging conditions between Lake Michigan and Lake Huron particularly, and the production of prey. So in the diagram to the right, I sort of have this um, conceptual diagram based on predator consumption. So on the right side of it, if predators only consume large prey items, this maximizes their growth. However, this may decrease the amount of spawners and thus decrease recruitment. However, if they only eat small prey items, their growth is not maximized and prey will never reach maturity, which will also impact recruitment since they won't be able to reproduce. And this may lead us to sort of these implications for management. So for example, how many predators should we stock? And this may also indicate the vulnerability of prey. So for example, are prey able to reach a size refuge, meaning do they get big enough to where predators can't eat them? And if this is the case, then this may be a potential for compensatory reproduction at lower um, adult abundances. So what am I doing? Well, I want to investigate whether predators exhibit differences in brown goby consumption based on size. And I wanted to do this because it would help us identify foraging conditions. So between Lake Huron and Lake Michigan and identify if competition occurs between lake trout and walleye. And a couple of my research questions slash objectives are, do lake trout and walleye consume the same size round goby? And if so, this may indicate competition among predators for limited prey. An alternative hypothesis to this is that walleye consume smaller round goby than lake trout because lake trout on average, sorry, walleye on average are a lot smaller than lake trout. And another question I had was, do lake trout in Lake Michigan consume the same size round goby as in Lake Huron? And this may help us identify foraging conditions. And an alternative hypothesis to this is that lake trout on Lake Huron will consume larger round goby due to higher benthic productivity. So in general, Lake Huron is a lot more clear than Lake Michigan. And this allows more sun to penetrate through the water column onto the bottom of the lake, which is called the benthos, increasing their productivity. So in order to do this, we collected lake trout and walleye stomachs from anglers between the years 2017 and 2019. And then we dissected their stomachs and identified their contents. We counted them, measured, and then weighed all of the prey that we found. And a big question you might have is, how do we identify fish if it's been digesting for a long time in a predator's stomach? So in some cases, in very rare cases actually, we may open a stomach and the fish is perfectly intact and you could tell what it is. But the majority of the time we just see like a pile of bones. So with this, we sort of use the law of parsimony along with looking for um, key bones such as the otoliths, which we see in the middle, which are ear bones, and then the clitor, which are fin support bones. And we specifically look for these bones because their appearance is usually species specific. So for example, in the otoliths of alewife, they look like these little middens. 
And then if you compare it to a gizzard shad, they also look like middens. But if you look closely, the bottom of the gizzard shad otoliths are a lot more flat, which helps us delineate between an alewife or a gizzard shad. And with this, we use statistical tests in our analysis to determine differences between um, round goby size consumption in lake trout versus walleye, and also differences in Lake Michigan versus Lake Huron in these consumed goby sizes. So do walleye and lake trout consume the same size round goby? Well, initially we thought that walleye would consume smaller round goby because in general, walleye are a lot smaller than lake trout. However, we found in Lake Huron that walleye eat significantly larger round goby than lake trout. And they consume a mean size of about 80 millimeters compared to lake trout, which consume a mean size of about 71 millimeters. Another question we had was whether if prey size affected the size of gobies that were consumed. So once again, we thought that walleye would consume smaller round gobies because in general, they are smaller than lake trout. However, we did find that walleye are smaller, but lake trout are consuming smaller round goby than walleye. And the figure in the bottom, um, it's a little bit clustered, but on the y-axis, we have goby length in millimeters and predator length on the x-axis in millimeters. And once we separate by species, um, lake trout is red and walleye is blue, we saw that a larger portion of our samples of lake trout were much larger than walleye. And this is just another figure to demonstrate um, the size differences between walleye and lake trout in the density of our samples. So in our comparison between Lake Huron and Lake Michigan, we thought that Lake Huron would have these bigger round gobies because of this idea that benthic production is higher in Lake Huron. But we found that lake trout consume larger round goby in Lake Michigan with the mean being about 97 millimeters compared to 71 millimeters in Lake Huron. So this indicates that lake trout consume larger variety sizes of Lake Michigan, which we could also see in the figure to the right, and that a greater proportion of round goby are becoming larger before predation. So overall, we see a larger presence of larger round goby in Lake Michigan, and this may indicate that there is higher productivity in Lake Michigan, and also that the presence of alewife may affect prey selection within the two species. However, a future avenue for research may be comparing or seeing if there's competition between lake trout and walleye, depending on season. So other authors have found that walleye specialize on prey items by the season and by basin. However, this has not been yet conducted with a cross comparison between two different lakes. So Lake Michigan versus Lake Huron. Currently in the Great Lakes, round goby are an important prey item for native predators. And that competition between lake trout and walleye do ex does exist for round goby. However, can we expect a decline in round goby in the future? We don't know if round goby are a sustainable prey. So will we be seeing this sort of swapping between one invasive species for another in case another invasive species makes its way into the Great Lakes? That we don't know. And this leads to unclear implications for the sustainability of Great Lakes predator populations. And this project would have not been possible without these collaborators. So this is a big thank you for everyone that worked with the project. And if you'd like to stay up to date with our project, we do have a Facebook page called the Huron Michigan Predator Diet Study. So you can follow us on social media. And these are just a couple pictures of me from fishing trips. And my email is also there if you'd like to contact me. Wow, very cool. It seems like such an awesome um, research project to be on. Um, so if it's okay with you, we can open it up to um, Q&A. Um, again, if anyone has any questions, if you're on the Zoom webinar, feel free to use that Q&A function at the bottom of the webinar. 
Um, or if you're viewing from Facebook, feel free to ask your questions right in the, the comment section. We'll be sure to ask those. Um, but to start out, I'm really curious what it was like um, doing this research. I'm hoping you could talk a little bit about what your experience was like, what a typical day was like. So my typical day of research was just coming into lab and just opening these stomachs. I'm not going to lie, it's pretty stinky. But sometimes when we do open these stomachs, we do find sort of interesting prey items. Um, I think the most interesting one I found was around Gobi, who was also eating a fish inside of the stomach. So that's some <laughs> interesting ecology right there. Yeah, fishception. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that's wild. Sorting through all those tiny little bones. Um, how about how big were those? Um, some of them can be relatively small. Um, I would guess that like a size of a clathrum, which is, you know, the fin support bone, average size would be about like 20 millimeters um, or like two centimeters. So. Wow. Oh, so did you have like a magnifying glass like to compare? Oh yeah, we have microscopes in the lab. And a lot of the time we would have like these separate pieces of vertebra that we'd have to like piece together and very cool it sounds like fun maybe stinky but fun <laughs> definitely stinky but it's also interesting um so we do have a couple questions um someone wants to know what um how big is the biggest fish that you ever dissected the biggest fish um i would probably say about 35 inches um and that was a coho salmon. Wow. And then where do you think this research will take you next? Hopefully this research will take me ultimately to a paper, which I would love to write about. Um, but I hope to go to med school after this. Um, <clears throat> so you said this is an on ongoing project and if people want to learn more, they can follow you on social media. Um, are there, is there more research planned this summer then? Um, during the summer, we will be collecting more stomachs, hopefully, which we will then analyze in the lab. We are also open to any volunteers who'd like to donate stomachs from the fish they have caught in Lake Huron and Lake Michigan. Oh, very cool. It's like a fun citizen, uh, science project there right mm -hmm. uh all right well we are running out of time but we do have one last question um they're curious about sea lamprey uh what type of fish do you um sea lamprey eat mostly so generally sea lamprey do they have these like sort of weird teeth and they do latch on into onto lake trout and it leaves sort of these round sort of blister looking things on the lake trout which does lead to them sucking like nutrients from the fish and then killing them. I did previously work in a lab that focused on sea lamprey, so it was pretty interesting. Um, great. Um, well, thank you again, Angelica, for, um, for joining us and telling us all about your research. Um, we have a couple people asking um, where they can find a recording of this talk. Um, you can find it on Facebook. Um, we'll have all of recordings of all of our uh, live streams from tonight. Um, and we'll be sure to share your, your Facebook page as well so people can continue to um, stay in the know about this research that you're doing. So um, thank you again. Great. Thank you for everyone to li for listening to me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and for everyone joining, um, be sure to check out our full schedule events. You can learn more on our website at sciencefestival.msu.edu. Thanks so much. Take care.